series for fall. And I've invited two uh, ladies from Bay County Conservancy, Candace Harbison and Teresa Newney, to tell us a little bit about the urban forests and urban preserves that we have here in Bay County. And specifically, I think we may be talking about some you know, Panama City preserves before and after the hurricane. We've actually worked with you guys a little bit cleaning up, helping you to clean up a couple of the preserves. Right. So we'd like to continue doing that. Um, so without uh, further ado, I'm going to go ahead and, and let Candace and Teresa take it away. All right, thank you. Um, let's, be, let's be all gathered up and cozy here, and we'll have kind of a roundtable discussion. Um, so this slideshow is very different a year ago, but everybody's life is different from what it was a year ago, and this is what we're dealing with now. Uh, who we are, what we are, the Bay County Conservancy, and almost everybody calls us Nature Conservancy, but we're really not affiliated at all with the Nature Conservancy, the one that the international organization. We're strictly a local organization formed in Panama City, not-for-profit, uh, purpose is preservation of environmentally sensitive lands. Uh, we started out just focusing on urban wetlands in Panama City, but various people donated lands to us or things came up for sale that we could get, and we've expanded to where we actually have uh, properties in five counties. So we changed our name, or at least added a subtext to the name, and now we call ourselves Bay County Conservancy, the Land Conservancy of Northwest Florida. Okay. This is our motivating factor. You see this every place you look all the time. You see um, places that you thought were beautiful, being bulldozed, you know, we want it to look different from this in the future, so we have to work for it now. This is our list of preserves. They total 286 acres, so we're not a big organization. We don't have a lot of land. Uh, the smallest one's probably number 16, the Conway property. It's just a little strip of land that was donated to us in Mexico Beach. It's more of a ditch than anything else but at least nobody will build on it. Um, our biggest one is number three, Tumble Creek Preserve. It's in Washington County. It's 82 acres, and we keep hoping maybe we can add more to that. It's a lot, nice, pristine, sand hill country, and it has Tumble Creek on it. It has a little bitty creek with some sphagnum moss <laughs> and some clear water that is in the very far headwaters of Econfina Creek and Deer Point Lake and our water supply here. Okay. These aren't just green spaces. They're not just land sitting fallow. These are working lands. They provide these various functions and we'll go over some of them individually. They provide wildlife habitat and biodiversity. When I'm talking to some audiences, I usually define biodiversity. I expect this audience knows what biodiversity is. Ron, tell us. lots of different kinds of living things that are natives. Yep. Um, back just a minute. <laughs> uh, this one, uh, any bird watchers other than Ron out here who can tell me what it is? Carrie, what is it? Exactly, yes, yes. That is the Panama City crayfish, an endemic species, meaning it's found here and no place else. It's kind of on the threatened list. Uh, the, 
the city hates it. They get apoplectic when you mention the Panama City crayfish because they were expected to try to protect it. And one of the places it loves to live is in drainage ditches because that's about the only place it has left. And of course, the city wants to go along and you know, uh, mow and scrape the drainage ditches ever lower and ever lower. And they were told there are places they can't do that because of the crayfish. So we have turned two of our preserves over to Fish, Florida Fish and Wildlife Conservation Commission, the State Wildlife Agency, and the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, who are cooperating to manage these two preserves for crayfish, Panama City crayfish habitat. Um, this one, 10 acres, it's a frivolous name, but it's, it's a non-frivolous property. Um, we just call it Marjorie Simone for short, <laughs> or M3, S3. If you're typing it. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, this is the sign there that explains that it, the, the trees were removed and it's, uh, it's, it's kept open and periodically wet in um, the habitat that the, the crayfish like and thrive in. And it's been successful. And then um, the other one, Talkington Family Preserve, is in Lynn Haven on Jenks Avenue, about 24th and Jenks. You may have driven by there and seen the sign. Um, it's also been very successful for crayfish habitat. Okay. Oh, it's up near Deer Point Lake. It's um, an, a subdivision called High Point. <laughs> Another thing that wetlands and, and green spaces do is uh, help clean the air. Now in this day of climate change, you know, meltingly hot days in September, you know, that's a pretty good sign that uh, we're getting, uh, we're changing, getting in trouble. Uh, the, the green growing things produce oxygen, take in carbon dioxide, the more open space and green space we have, the better for us. The uh, Lansing Smith power plant here used to put out big plumes of smoke uh, when it was coal fired. I think it's all, do you know, is it all gas fired now? Natural gas, so it's, it's less polluting than it used to be. But we still have a lot of air pollution that we need to overcome, and the, the green plants do that in their natural, <coughs> natural process. Then stormwater retention is another extremely important function of these lands. Um, big parking lots, roads, uh, roofs, uh, you know, stormwater runs off of all of these. The wetlands slow it down and clean it. And then the ultimate test of uh, stormwater protection is the flood control during hurricanes when we have a, frequently have a lot of rain. Now we were kind of lucky in Michael that we didn't have that much rain, but um, you know, we could have had an event like occurred in Houston or, uh, or the Bahamas. So it's very important to have these areas that can absorb that water when it comes down in, in big rushes. Uh, the um, Audubon Nature Preserve was our very first uh, preserve. This is why Bay County Conservancy was formed as an offshoot of the Audubon Society. Audubon used its money to pay for this uh, 30 acres of land, which is do we have a location slide? I think so, yes. Yeah, which is, um, that is Walmart up there on 23rd Street. So this is the Doctor's Pond area on State Avenue. Uh, and then over here we have two other parcels that are lumped in with that uh, preserve. 
and that totals 30 acres. And Audubon, after two years of negotiation, bought it from the doctors that started Gulf Coast Hospital. This was kind of leftover land, and we knew that it would eventually be paved for parking lots if we didn't do something. And at that time, it was much wetter than it is now. You could actually go out there and see wood ducks and muskrats, and uh, even, I think we have a picture of Ron in a canoe out there one time. <laughs> but, um, okay, are, are we back before this? Okay, yeah. So uh, with help from AmeriCorps, we built, they built for us this gazebo and boardwalk so people could get out into the swamp. Uh, what we didn't realize was that this gazebo looks like home to so many people. <laughs> we have had people, uh, homeless people, bring sheets of plywood and try to frame it in and make a house out of it. I was there a few days ago. <coughs> Somebody had a hammock strung up in it and was sleeping in the hammock. Uh, we have had people building fires there, campfires there. Um, it's, um, it's been a maintenance problem, but it's still a nice place. It's nice to, to go there and see maybe nurses from Gulf Coast Hospital across the street coming over here having a coffee break or something. Um, we, uh, we have used it for field trips with children, educational trips, some school groups have come out. This was a preschool group that we did a little nature walk with. We had two trails nicely laid out. Now they are covered with trees, but, <laughs> um, okay. We will be working on those trees on the trails. This is what urban lands degenerate into. We have, we have had to go in and clean up messes like this any number of times. This was on the parcel of Audubon Nature Preserve off of Jinx Avenue. Um, we got the help of the sheriff's department. They brought out some prisoners. We rented a dumpster. We cleaned it up but it takes constant vigilance and constant maintenance in town. Okay. But we prefer to, to look at the positive side, the school groups and the wildlife that we can nurture with these lands. Uh, city drainage and a drought. We had like a seven year drought right after we bought this property. And then the city came along and they paved, um, expanded and paved State Avenue and Jenks Avenue, and they did a lot of more drainage and took most of our water away. So the pond that used to be there that, was, that we called Doctor's Pond, that way back in the early days, maybe when Jane and Ron were growing up here, maybe the rest of you grew up here in town, it was known as Passion Pond. <laughs> um, that disappeared. So now it's more of an ephemeral marsh. When it rains, it's wet. When it doesn't rain, it dries up. Our other big problem with urban uh, wetlands and properties in general is invasive plants. Constant work to try to keep them out and keep the natives going. Um, go back just a minute. Um, if you see any of these in your yard, please, please get rid of them. Popcorn trees, take them away. Japanese climbing fern, very invasive, get rid of it. And uh, air potato, lots of people think the air potato is beautiful. I actually think that's a picture of grapevine there. But it's a bit of both, I think. <laughs> <laughs> there, uh, there's probably some air potato in with it. Um, They're kind of heart-shaped, and they turn a very pretty color in the fall. People love them because they turn a nice orange in the fall. I had volunteered jump trees, but I don't know what they are for. But they're not that pretty. I mean, they don't just need some pink color. Oh, OK. Oh, 
or they might be cherry laurels. There are lots and lots of those that volunteer, and they're native, but they're pretty invasive. So if you don't want them, pull them up. Okay. So about um, every January, we like to have an air potato roundup. Our, the, um, the orthopedic offices near the traffic circle at 19th and State Avenue have a, a, <laughs> an infestation of air potatoes. And we um, try to get out and control those. Some years, there are lots of the potatoes, the bulbuls that, that or they have the seed and they grow the new plants. So we can round those up. Um, the last time we did it, there weren't many potatoes, but there were, the vines were just everywhere. So we tried to get in and cut the vines out. But it's, um, it's kind of fun and it's rewarding. We, we um, have tried to put nature on our side and invasive, well not invasive, exotic species on our side. This air potato beetle was developed. What, University of Florida was it? Yeah, they've done a lot of studies there. And the beetle comes from Asia. But it's the only, the only thing it will eat is air potato vine. So we have gradually put these air potato beetles to work on our preserves. It works well down south. We are sort of the northern zone where we're not sure if they'll make it through the winter. So it's a hit or miss thing. At the moment, it's a combined effort, pulling um, picking up potatoes and hoping the beetles will repopulate and eat the, the leaves and bulbs. And we don't know if the beetles made it through the hurricane or no, not. No, we don't. We have not seen them. <laughs> but here's a, oh, Oops, sorry. here's a good picture of what the air potato looks like. A nice heart-shaped leaf with deep veins in it. Can be glossy. People grow it as an ornamental. They think it's beautiful. Okay. So this was what happened after the hurricane. We had a mess, although the gazebo was fine. It was untouched. Well, we had some lattice work on top. That blew off, but otherwise it was fine. But we had trees all over the boardwalk. Well, here, here is the boardwalk <laughs> underneath all the trees and the branches and everything. Okay. Um, the Forest Service did this map which shows all the timber damage from Hurricane Michael, and you can see it just goes right through where all our property, almost all of our properties are. We have one over by Freeport that was okay. We have one in Franklin, little one in Franklin County, but most of them are right there in that swath, and we just lost most of our trees. So Randy Wright of Gulf Coast Tree Service, maybe you all know him or have used him, brought in a crew and they volunteered without charging us and cleared the boardwalk, which was great. You know, they just threw the trees to the side, but still they took their chainsaws down and cleared it out and that was wonderful. Uh, but it was broken. Um, yeah. It was broken and we still have all this these big piles of debris. So we had a work day and volunteers, many of them from the college, staff, students, um, uh, also members of Bay County Conservancy and members of the Lynn Haven Garden Club, um, um, Irvin Clark from FSU. Um, we had a lot of help that day and we accomplished a great deal. The sign had been lying in the swamp, and um, we got people to get the sign out, and it was amazingly undamaged. Once we took it out of the framework, the, uh, the informational part was undamaged, and we're going to reframe it and put it back up. a sign company do it and it's it held up for so many years yeah. and it was it was amazing under that plexiglass so there was plexiglass. yes it had a plexiglass cover that's the only reason it was tight tightly yeah. sealed and it yes. at the time it wasn't in direct sunlight now it might be a different story it might fade and but <laughs> yes right it was yeah. a it was a piece of vinyl that we had to unroll and yeah. 
smooth onto a backing. I actually, yeah. I'm still in touch with the guy who made that sign. He used to live near me. He's now in South Florida. And I showed him, I, there's a better picture. I said, your sign work held up because he had offered to find the file and make it for us again. And we, I was able to show him, you know what, it's still good. So that was a great one. <laughs> Anyway, Carrie, there's a good picture of you right there. Um, we had lots of people who just accomplished a lot in a short period of time. Chainsaws and people to carry the, the chainsaw bits out to the curb. Um, my husband fixed the broken spot in the boardwalk. Um, and it was a hot, hot day. <laughs> oh, yeah. Yeah, we had a a couple of people go home sick, they got so overheated. But we ended up with this huge pile out on the street for the city to come and pick up. So. Yeah, so you go back to, you go back to the guy on the left there, Bert, Dr. Irving, Irving Clark at FSU, uh, he was just uh, inducted into the uh, Florida A&M uh, uh, Hall of Fame for foot, he was a football player in there back oh, uh, really? years ago. Oh. <laughs> well, we were happy to have his help. <laughs> so, you can get to the gazebo, you can get a little way down the path now. We still don't have the paths cleared so that you can go all the way, but it's, it's a beginning. Another of our urban areas is the Mariola Reynolds Miller Palm Preserve. If you have been in Panama City very long, you would remember Mariola Miller, who had the Gallery of Art on West Beach Drive and was a real motivating factor in the community for arts um, and was a lovely person. She donated these four building, small building lots next to her Gallery of Art to the Conservancy. And at the time she donated it, we counted, and there were 70 of the native of our state trees on it, the sable palm. So we called it the Palm Preserve. Um, it's just a, a nice little green spot, green haven, uh, pocket park in downtown Panama City. It attracts birds, lizards. Um, and it serves very well as stormwater retention. You can see when it, um, when it rains, it, the low spot in it fills up, and then it slowly either evaporates or does one of these other functions of a wetland. The, uh, it recharges the aquifer. The rain water seeps down through into the aquifer and in the groundwater and is kept there um, for the use of wells or to flow, flow out to the bay. Now, you want to talk about the wildflower garden? Yeah. This is another process we've gone through several phases of. We um, have had a lot of volunteers helping us start sort of a wildflower meadow. We don't have a lot of control over water at this preserve, so our problem has always been we can plant, if we don't get the raid for the seedlings, we have a tough time keeping them going. So this is an ongoing project, and we are getting ready again to do another seeding of these meadow areas this fall. We have some volunteers from our local chapter of the Florida Native Plant Society that come and help us. So if you're interested in that sort of project, we will be announcing that date also coming up. And these are some of the flowers that we've had over there through time. We've had passion vines. At the moment we have coral honeysuckle and swamp mallows, scarlet hibiscus are there. And it depends on what seeds sort of beat out the weeds because we do have a lot of weed problem. That's, it's sort of, and right now it's going through some tough times. We're trying to let the weeds, we had it tilled over, let the weeds get uh, dead and we'll do another reseed. It sort of changes through time. And continue. Okay. 
Then in 2016, <laughs> our uh, honored guest here <laughs> on the front row, Jane Perry, um, <coughs> came up with the idea of painting a mural on the Gallery of Art wall. And we, um, we found a little bit of money and to buy paint. And um, she put up uh, Maxwell Miller, who owns the Gallery of Art now, Mariola's son, has been very helpful all, all through the time that we have owned the uh, preserve. And um, look how it blends in. You can hardly tell the difference between the real trees and the painted trees. They have fooled me from time to time. There's a real cypress and there's a real palm. The others are painted. Isn't that beautiful? And we had to get special permission from the city. The city had decided they did not want murals. And I guess because they thought that people wouldn't keep them up and they'd become dilapidated. So they passed a rule, no murals downtown. So we had to beg and meet with several different people and plead and pull political strings till we got permission to do this mural. Now people are going around bragging um, that, oh, there are murals downtown. Yes, we're going to make it a, a mural city. <laughs> um, so this was before, and this was after the storm. Uh, that bit about uh, open lands being a place to absorb hurricane waters, well, the storm surge came up through downtown and brought all this debris and deposited it in our preserve. So we had several small internal work days to get started on cleaning it up. And then uh, during spring break in March, um, this group of kids from Rollins College came up and spent a couple of days in the local area. And they spent one whole morning with us working on the preserve. <coughs> My daughter goes to Rollins, and I was the one who contacted their, um, oh. them and just said, we need help here because they like to do projects like that during their breaks. And I was so happy when they actually decided to come. I, I hadn't heard anything after that. So it was a really a surprise. So you were, we wondered, how did they know to contact us? Right. And one of those oh. volunteers knew your daughter, too, it turned out, right? Oh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Work. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so that was that was a big help. And Maxwell Miller, whom we mentioned, uh, pulled this tree up. It had blown over. He pulled it out and staked it, and thinks it will continue to live. And oh, and back just a minute. This is the area that was just tilled that we plan to replant in wildflowers. And Mark Thompson, some of you probably know him, brought his little garden tiller and did that work for us. Then a St. Joe Company gave us a check for $1,500 to help uh, replace our signs. Most of our signs were crumpled or the uh, stakes were twisted, the signs blew over or twisted around. So we're going to have to replace a number of them, and uh, we appreciate their help in giving us these, the money for signs. Uh, <laughs> we thought maybe we could straighten it out. <laughs> it didn't work. <laughs> That's your active board in action, though. <laughs> <laughs> Another of our properties is in Lynn Haven, College Point. Uh, we bring it up because it's, uh, it's such a case in point. It was donated to us three acres with a cottage, and uh, we decided the house was in such bad shape we couldn't do anything with it, so we sold the house and the half acre it sits on to, uh, to Patty Kelly, actually. Some of you probably know Patty with the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, and she is uh, making it very nice, fixing it up. But so we have the two and a half acres around that, and Teresa and um, 
and, and others had worked on getting this place all cleaned up and straightened up and, um, and clearing paths. And we had sent out invitations to the neighbors, and the neighbors were all so excited about coming to the grand opening of the Palm of the uh, Olds Preserve on October the 12th. Well, you know what happened on October the 10th. <laughs> this is what it looked like. So um, we're starting from scratch. And like most pine trees in Bay County, these all snapped. Um, many of them, uh, Patty Kelly donated uh, money to uh, have some of these trees cut off and left them high so they can be used by woodpeckers and other birds that will eat the insects out of the bark. So instead of cutting them at the ground, you can leave trees you know, 15 feet high or so, and they'll be good wildlife habitat. Um, again, we had um, people from the college and other places um, come and help us on a work day. This is David Figueroa from Gulf Coast College. Um, one of the neighbors has this, uh, borrowed this skid steer, this little bobcat with a forklift on front of, the front of it from her father, and she really did a great job of clearing out the uh, logs that we chainsawed off. So the whole driveway area and access way area is now clear but we still have a lot of work to do on the paths. Juniper Headwaters is 40 acres up near Fountain, just west of Fountain. A very nice property. It has a, um, a wildflower meadow in the middle of many, <laughs> many pines and uh, many uh, tai tais. Um, we have to do control burn there periodically or we would lose the wildflower meadow because the trees always come in and try to take over the meadow. Again, we had it nicely manicured. We had done a recent burn. We had cleared a loop trail. Um, we had put up little signs for the trail. We had all our signs up. Uh, it was flourishing. There's a deer up there if you can't see it. Um, And uh, the hurricane did the same job on it that it did on all the other pine lands around. Uh, we could not, when Teresa and I went up there, we couldn't even get into the property. I mean, this is the access road here, and it's totally impassable. Um, the sign was here. This tree came down right across the sign. You would think the sign would have been under the tree, but it wasn't. We have no idea where the sign went. <laughs> but we are having a cleanup day there at Juniper Headwaters in, what, a week and a half or so? September the 28th, and we'd love to have any volunteers who are willing to come. Uh, Equipment is nice, chainsaws and all, if you're experienced, adult, know how to use it, but just plain uh, muscle power is good too. The willingness to pick up a stick and move it someplace else is helpful. It can be wet up there, it probably isn't because it's been so very dry lately, but uh, sometimes rubber boots are useful up there. Um, it is uh, about 25 miles up in the country, but we're going to carpool. And I believe that Teresa has some flyers over here. Yep. So if you are at all interested in helping us that day, um, grab a flyer. Yeah, we could. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> bring your bobcat. <laughs> Yeah, that was that was the thing. We found that we could get people with chainsaws to fell these trees, but now we need to get the big logs moved so we can get in and do the small stuff. So that has been our stopping point on some of these preserves. So if anybody knows anybody that's able to help with that sort of thing, we, we have could put them to work. And we do have some neighbors who live in Fountain who are interested in the preserve and uh, 
Um, I'm hoping that they will come out and, and help us, and they may have some equipment. Okay. And that is it. Oh. That's the end. That's the end? Yep. Oh, all right. <laughs> <laughs> Our regular slideshow is a lot longer, so. <laughs> okay, so discussion. Tell, tell me what you think of the projects, the preserves. What do we need to do? What are you interested in? What, um, we could always use uh, another board member or two. We so could. We have a board, a vol totally volunteer board that meets, um, usually, well, ostensibly once a month, but we, we've kind of fallen back on maybe more like every other month. But uh, we meet um, and just, uh, you know, come up with ideas. Um, we do a lot of the work ourselves, but we, you don't have to. We have some board members who would not step foot in the forest. <laughs> And uh, we do sort of have a job opening too for four to eight hours a week. If somebody could be or wants to be a very part time property manager, we need somebody that is willing to haul and use a brush mower and tools like that. Because I've lost, I've lost my property manager. We used to have a pretty good deal going on where he is now the Mexico Beach fire chief. <laughs> yes, I curse Mexico Beach. <laughs> Because he was a great guy. He, would, uh, he and I would pretty much tackle all of these preserves. He'd bring the brush mower in, and he would cut, and I would haul out. But now I don't have the hauler to do the, the mowing or carry or haul a trailer around with our mowers. So we are, we are stuck for the big work. So if anyone's looking for a very part-time job, it's four to eight hours a week as, as we come across the need. And we also go out and pick up litter on some of these preserves, so it's, it's not a very glorious job, but it is a lot more fun with two, and it's not that big of a deal. And it's rewarding. It. Mm -hmm. right. That's what yeah. the secretary does at Bay County Conservancy. <laughs> <laughs> uh, if you uh, can't you know, join the board, we can always use you as a member. Yeah. Absolutely. We have membership brochures over yep. on the table. And there's some information there on popcorn trees and how to get rid of them. There's also a brochure there for our local chapter of the Florida Native Plant Society, who have some great people helping us on our preserves and helping us identify plants and doing work. So it's like, you know how it is. We all wear many hats and belong to different groups, and some, some of their info is over there, too. The advantage of being a member here is only have one membership meeting a year. Right. <laughs> <laughs> right. That's true. We have an annual meeting we report to the, the members what we've done during the year and then vote on the <coughs> board, vote on electing board members. Other than that, we don't have public meetings. We, obviously, we have volunteer uh, Yes, events. volunteer hours, too. Any students at, at the high schools or college level that need volunteer or community service hours, I will work with them. So send them our way, we, and we'll go out and do a few hours. So. Mm. All right, thank you, Ron. Thank you, Carrie, for setting this up. You're very welcome. Thank you, ladies. Uh, very nice. Good, good program. It's a short, abbreviated version of our long one. Yeah. <laughs>